Good afternoon and welcome to Spotlight On, the debate breakdown. This program is a production of Richmond Student Media and Richmond Student Government Association. I'm your host, Damon Craig. The Texas Senate debate between incumbent Senator John Cornyn and MJ Hager took place using a fast, uh, fast response format. We'll talk with Richmond students about the debate and find out what they learned. Richmond government professor Patrick Moore will moderate the discussion. We will review five clips from the Senate debate. The topics include economy, the COVID vaccine, Black Lives Matter, climate change, and the decriminalization of marijuana. We will listen to the clips and ask our student panelists to respond. The first question deals with the economic impact of COVID on the Texas economy and whether the candidates would vote for a second round of direct stimulus to Texans if elected. You know, I used to wait tables. I was a bartender. I've been laid off from a job. I, I think it's so critical that we have people in a position to make these decisions who have actually faced these challenges. So, you know, I believe we can't attack the economic crisis until we get the public health crisis under control because the public health crisis is leading. We can open businesses all we want, but there won't be customers there to patronize the businesses. So, um, you know, I believe we need more stimulus. I'm upset that the, the government and the Senate haven't acted in over six months. I was upset that John Cornyn said that he didn't feel a sense of urgency to get more relief out, said that multiple times. Um, I'd like to see us get the pandemic under control by listening to public health experts and data. Um, and then I'd like to see us get the economic crisis under control for regular working Americans and Texans because we are the backbone of this economy, not the wealthy corporate special interests. So if you were elected to the Senate today, you would not support direct stimulus checks to Texas? I do support direct stimulus checks as a part of a bigger package. Um, I'm very upset that the president decided to take his ball and go home and, and stop negotiations. Mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell just said we're not going to negotiate until after the uh, election. I got to tell you, rent's due on the first. And a lot of people in D.C. don't understand how that feels. We do have a sense of urgency to get stimulus before this election because Texans are struggling now. Okay, thank you. Senator Cornyn, would, would you promise to uh, vote for direct stimulus checks to Texans? You have 60 seconds. Grumor, I not only would, I have. Um, I was part of a bipartisan coalition, really almost a unanimous vote of the United States Senate and the House uh, to pass $3.8 trillion in spending, both to fight the, fight the pandemic, the public health challenge, and as well as deal with the uh, economic consequences associated with it. My heart goes out to those people who, through no fault of their own, find themselves without a paycheck, locked down perhaps with somebody who is abusing them, anxious about the, 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 where their next uh, meal is going to come from. I've actually done something about it by supporting this bipartisan $3.8 trillion expenditure. But we need to do more. And I hope that uh, the, the White House and Speaker Pelosi will continue to negotiate. But what I don't understand is MJ's, the chief sponsor for her candidacy, Chuck Schumer, single-handedly blocked $500 trillion in additional spending that would have made sure that a vaccine would have been available at the end of the year. I, I'm going to come back uh, to the stimulus checks in a moment with you. That $3.8 trillion, that was the first relief package. But Ms. Hagar, let me, let me ask well, I, you. I need to address that because he used my name. So, okay, go ahead. Um, yes, 30 you know, seconds. We're going to hear a lot of this tonight, and it's so frustrating. It must be frustrating for you, John, to not be able to run against Chuck Schumer, but he's running against MJ Hagar. But you're going to hear a lot of Pelosi and Schumer and other names because he can't run against my vision for this state because the people who are funding my campaign and are supporting my campaign are the grassroots army across the state. He has called a liberal mob that have come together and stood arm in arm and given an average of $23 to this campaign. And we've raised millions that way because Texans are done. Okay, students, what is your response to this clip? This was, it was really interesting, the, the byplay between uh, the candidates um, and their approach to a new round of stimulus checks. What, are you, what is your opinion of the idea of new round of stimulus checks? Would that make a difference in your vote, for example? So what is your reaction to uh, the discussion of the new round of stimulus checks? And I'll, let's start with you, Ferdinando, this time. Okay. Well, thanks so much, uh, Patrick Moore. Uh, for me, I think I mentioned that before, that the stimulus check, if it is right now, I would see it more like they're doing it because they want my vote. 
that um, my vote really wouldn't uh, be subjected by the stimulus check. Um, however, I, of course, I do appreciate it, <laughs> but it wouldn't affect my vote. Honestly, it's, it's something that I feel it would have so uh, it would have happened before, and not, like it should have happened before, and not right now. Uh, I think that's yeah. I think it will be too political right now. Got it. Edward, uh, what about you? Uh, how do you see this debate? Um, well, it was a sad thing I didn't watch it the full one, but um, thanks for the clip, by the way. Um, well, I just want to say that, um, yes, stimulus check is a good idea for like a month, to pay your bills for a month, for the whole month. So when I was listening to M MG Hanger, I, I mean, she's right. First of all, we need to get this coronavirus under control, people's health under control. I mean, yes, we can open businesses, we can bring stimulus check all day, all week. And although, and although, yeah, she was saying that she, and I was mad too when the president stopped negotiations because, you know, I mean, we are suffering over here, you know what I'm saying? So what's the point of you stopping the negotiation? But all of a sudden he, he's like, he was like, oh, I think after the elections, if I'm correct, after the elections, that's when um, there will be negotiation. I mean, come on, really? We're suffering right now. You're going to wait after the elections? I mean, what if you, if you lose? I mean, See, I just want to say, people don't think like about the circumstance that's going to happen. What if you lose? Are you still going to be like, oh, let's negotiate? I mean, yeah, maybe you can still have time to negotiate, but like now is the time to like negotiate and find a deal and stop um, bringing by, I mean, stop bringing partisan debate on politics, politics and this coronavirus. This coronavirus don't care about politics. It cares about killing people. So we all need to just come together and just negotiate and just do something about this economic and like, So I agree with MJ Hang on. So yeah. Got it. Reagan. Thank you, Patrick. As far as stimulus check goes, um, I actually agreed with what John um, Cornon was saying. Uh, he actually gave a lot of points that I haven't heard before from the um, Republican Party. And I actually appreciate that because I feel like this whole time we've just gotten kind of half of the um, answers. And I feel like he really gave us everything that they're doing as far as for the stimulus check. Um, but at the end of the day, I still um, agree with Hagar because um, we do need more stimulus check and we haven't got that. And our president has said, oh, well, I mean, you'll get it if I win the election. And I feel like that ultimatum is just unfair because like she said, the first of the month is coming up and people don't know what they're gonna do for their bills. So as far as the stimulus check goes, I think we need a lot more. And I think we need a better system and a better um, just communication overall. I kind of agree with what Edward was saying. We need to come together and not look at it as a political thing, but look at it as people need aid and they need it immediately. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Reagan. Um, and uh, Damon. Damon, back to you to introduce the next clip. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Moore. So our next question deals with a vaccine. As you know, many schools in Texas, including ours, is using a hybrid approach to teaching. When the COVID vaccine is available and we return to campus, should it be mandatory for students to get the vaccine before returning to school? Well, I don't think we have a vaccine available yet, and we need to get our kids and teachers back in the classroom as safely as possible. When I've been talking to teachers and parents, and I'm doing virtual kindergarten right now with my six-year-old, um, I know that school is more than just a place for education. It's a place for community and nutrition and screening for abuse, and we have isolation issues. We, we really need to work with teachers and public health experts and parents to get our kids back into school. But in July, when we had over 1,700 positive cases of kids with COVID, John Cornyn said we're not even sure if kids can catch COVID. Y'all, we need leaders that are informed, that either have the right information and have competence to make these decisions, or when they have that right information, don't insist on spreading misinformation and talking points from their, from their party leadership. Ms. Hagar, if scientists said that there is a COVID-19 vaccine right now, Yes, would I am for you, vaccinations. You would allow uh, your there children. There are multiple vaccinations that uh, our children are required to take to keep each other safe. Um, I'm actually not a huge fan of the government mandating things on your body, um, but especially when it comes to, you know, we don't have the right to make other people sick and to, to put other people and their kids at risk. So, yes, I support vaccinations. Okay, Senator Cornyn, just to repeat the question for you and for those at home as well. You have 60 seconds for this question, by the way. Should it be mandatory for children to get 
get a COVID-19 vaccine before going back to school? Well, I don't believe a vaccine is available right now, and I do think it's important for our kids to go back to school to safely return to school. But um, Ms. Hagar mentioned, uh, uh, made a false statement about my, my, my earlier remarks with regard to children getting, it's not clear what the role is if children get the virus, how and if they can spread it. We've learned a lot, as I've said, through, uh, from the beginning of this virus, and we now know that kids can get it and they can spread it to people who are vulnerable. That's why it's important to protect the most vulnerable people. But Mike Morath, the chair, uh, commissioner of education, told me that there is 2 million school children in Texas currently going to in-classroom instruction out of 5 million students. And I support kids going to school when they can safely do so in consultation with their parents because one of the biggest problems is poor children who don't have access to broadband or the or the internet are in a, are falling farther and farther behind and that's a human tragedy. If there were a vaccine available today Senator Cornyn and it is approved, would you require a mandate for children to get it before they can go back to the classroom? I think the people who should get the the the, the vaccine first are the people who are most likely to die if they get COVID-19 which means people over 80 and people with underlying chronic illnesses. 99 roughly percent of the people who get the virus are gonna recover. Some of them are, will end up in the hospital, but children by and large tolerate the virus well and are not, not, not hospitalization is not part of the, uh, does not result. So I think it would be important to start with the people who are at the greatest risk first. Sally, uh, I can't allow please. that misinformation to go out because okay, I'll give you people 30. make decisions based on the things that people that they respect say. Um, this absolutely does impact children and, and they don't tolerate it well. We don't even know what the long-term um, implications are of this disease, but in March of this year, March, months before the statements, I mean, he's accusing me of making false statements, we saw in New York, I think it was 65 kids had inflammatory organ symptoms. I, I don't know what the, I don't remember what the technical term of, of it was, but as a concerned parent, I was damn sure paying attention. And, and I'm very concerned about the impact of this disease on our children. Senator Cornyn, would you like to respond to that? I'll give you 30 seconds as well. Well, of course we're all concerned, but we have to, we have to think, look at the priorities. I mean, that's the reason why I think local control is important when it comes to children going back to school. And because it has to be done when the parents and the teachers are comfortable with them safely reentering the school. But MJ mentioned local control. She said uh, when Governor Abbott said that the Austin City Council shouldn't cut funding for the police, she said, well, what about local control? In other words, she tacitly agreed that defunding the police was okay. I don't tacitly do I couldn't do be anything. more different in that regard. I so what do y'all think, having watched the clip? Uh, should students should richland college students or excuse me should dallas college richland campus students uh, be required to have the vaccine before uh, coming back to class on campus and uh if if not should we be all we be coming back to campus more aggressively than we are uh, what do y'all think about that let's start with you this time reagan Thank you, Patrick. Um, I think it's hard to say because as of right now, the Republican Party has been so wishy-washy with the answer, and that makes it hard for somebody to take a vaccine. First, we have Trump saying, oh, we're going to get the vaccine out. Um, but then at the same time, he's telling a reporter, take off that mask, you don't need a mask, when scientists are saying you do need a mask. And other people as well feel that they are entitled to not wear a mask because they're present doesn't want to wear a mask. And that goes back into when she said people make decisions on things people say. Um, as well as when Pence said, oh, yeah, take the vaccine. But now we have our senator, who is a Republican senator, saying, I won't be the first person in line. But, yeah, you should take the vaccine. How should I feel comfortable taking a vaccine that you won't be first in line for? I don't feel comfortable putting myself on a line like that. Um, I want to go back to school. I want to be in a classroom setting. But how do I do that without feeling that the vaccine isn't a way for you to have a political advantage? Because my body and my immune system aren't your political advantage. Uh, that's that's uh, interesting. I have to say, I guess I should have said, uh, I'm facing the same thing. Uh, there will be a few, a small number of on-campus government classes 
uh, in the spring, and I very likely will be teaching on campus in the spring, one way or another, with or without a vaccine. And so I can, I will probably be there uh, wearing my mask, wearing a full face shield, probably wearing gloves, trying to stay away from everybody as best I can, uh, but standing in front of a classroom. And so uh, I'm facing the same issues that y'all are. Uh, it's not just about the students coming back. It's about the administrators and about the staff and about the the people who uh, help around the campus with the uh, maintenance and cleanup and the plant, watering the plants and, you know, all the stuff that has to be done. Uh, anyway, sorry for that little uh, uh, interjection there, but uh, let's move back um, to the people who we really want to hear from, and that is you next, Edward. Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Moore. Well, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna lie. I do agree with Reagan. You know, if the scientist goes to Dr. May's office, our chancellor, saying, "Look, Dr. May, this vaccine is right. We tested. We're good. Please test it on your." St and and Dr. May really tested, and it's like, "Okay, guys, I'm good." And and he emails, "Okay, guys, we have a vaccine. Please, students, please take it before you come back to school. I would definitely be happy to take it and go back to school." Like Reagan said. I want to go back to school. I am sick and tired of staying home. I mean, I love my house. I love my bed. I love my TV. I love my computer. I love everything. But I am sick and tired. Like, it's like I have no life. I really want to go out there. But my safety and my health is more important right now. And also, as a student government president, I care for my students as well, the student body. So, you know, the health and safety of the student body is my, is my you know, concern right now. So I won't. So, I won't be. I won't trust a president or any of the Republican Party. Be like, okay, guys, we are having a vaccine. It's. I mean, you know, I was talking. I was talking about this yesterday with my dad. Um, he was saying that a vaccine takes about ten years to like, you know, like a real vaccine to like come out. But you know, in this case, I think he was saying maybe minimum one and a half years. So pretty much like next year because they need to test it, perfect it, and you know, make sure everything is good and is working. But you have a president like, oh. We're gonna have a fa vaccine before election. We're gonna have a vaccine after election. We're gonna have a vaccine. I mean, at the end of the year, which one is it, man? Make up your mind. Which one is it? I mean, do you want to be political? You want me my vote, which I'm not gonna vote for you. Sorry about that, but you know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, you're not gonna confuse me. You're not gonna convince me. So that's my answer. Okay, thank you, Edward. Uh, Ferdinando, uh, what what is your take on all this? Yeah, I, I agree with both Edward and, and Regan. Um, for me, like, if it is not safe, we shouldn't be like exposing anybody. I mean, thankfully, I haven't been exposed to coronavirus. I feel like I'm quite healthy so far. And don't get me wrong, I have been adapted quite decently to this whole virtual setting. Um, but myself, I like, I try for communication with people. I really would love to, nothing would make me happier than just have people there, like touching them, like, ah, and hugging them, you know, like, that would be so amazing. Um, but first things first is the safety of, of, of people, even the safety of my family. So if there is not a vaccine, and I understand that there has to be a sacrifice in my end, and it's, that is like not going to campus until it's safe, I'm actually quite sorry that you, Patrick Moore, uh, have to like, yourself in, into that situation um, but yeah like for me that's not something that you should like politicize like uh, your health is not something to be politicized so I don't understand why somebody cannot just put the mask and understand that it is just I wouldn't say common sense but it's at the very least to, uh, some type of caring for for the person who's next to you so yeah okay thank you thank you Fernando uh, our next clip today is uh, dealing with the shooting of Jonathan Price. Uh, it's an African-American man shot in Wolf City, Texas, uh, killed by a police officer. Uh, that officer has been charged with murder. Um, the candidates in the debate, the senatorial debate, were asked their reaction to this event uh, and if they believe in the Black Lives Matter message or if they consider the killing to be just another unfortunate, uh, unavoidable, uh, isolated incident. And so let's watch this next clip. Well, I believe that all African-American lives matter. And when a police officer steps across the line, like uh, in the George Floyd murder, um, that they need to be investigated and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. 
but I support law enforcement because they are who keep our communities safe. And uh, unlike my opponent, who's actually endorsed this uh, Campaign Zero, you can check their website, go on the web, Campaign Zero. They not only want to defund police, they want to abolish the police, and they want to legalize things like prostitution. To me, those are not Texas values. We need to support our men and women in blue because they are the thin blue line between us and, and uh, danger. And so I think it's really, uh, really disappointing to hear people like MJ um, say that they don't respect the police, they don't want to fund the police, they want to abolish the police. It's just mind boggling to me. Ms. Hagar, do you agree with the Black Lives Matters message in response to Jonathan Price's killing, or do you think that this is an example of an isolated, unfortunate incident? We have a problem of systemic racism in this country, a problem that on the Senate floor John Cornyn denied existed. Um, if we're going to come together and acknowledge this problem, first of all, we need leaders who can cite the problem if we're going to fix it. Um, I do agree. I believe that black lives matter, and I believe we need policing reform. Now, I have been a first responder, and I have had to pull the trigger in the line of duty. So I take serious offense to anyone who says I don't support law enforcement. Um, I believe we need to support transparency and accountability, reform-minded leaders, and the police unions that are calling for reform as well. Now, for Campaign Zero, I have not seen that as part of their platform, and maybe their platform has changed. But if you go back and look at what I've said that I support, I said I supported things like the things set forward in Campaign Zero when they were talking about community policing and community oversight and body cameras and police officers representative of the communities that they're policing. Um, so he can't win against my actual positions. He has to misattribute them to me. Senator Cornyn, a follow up to that is what have you done? Have you met with any leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement? And you have 30 seconds for this follow-up question. Well, I met with Mayor Sylvester Turner in Houston and Mayor Johnson in Dallas, who both convened meetings of community leaders, including the uh, communities of color, to try to figure out what needed to be done. That's why I introduced, along with my colleague Tim Scott, the Justice Act that would do police reform, ban chokeholds, provide additional training to law enforcement officials for de-escalation of conflict, and encourage diversity. But I'm, I am not in the same camp as Ms. Hagar, who believes that we should tie the police's hands behind their back. I'm going to give you 15 seconds to answer if you have met with leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. I've met with black leaders, and I, but uh, not, as, not per se that I, I know of. I, frankly, I don't know necessarily who is and who is not a member. But I remember an African-American pastor in Houston who told me, Senator, I respect the police, but my son doesn't trust the police. That's the problem we need to address. Ms. Hager, have you met with any leaders of the Black Lives Matters movement? Uh Again, so I, I, I have to, to show some empathy here and say that it's not, people don't, I think we're, they don't introduce themselves as I'm a leader in the Black Lives Movement. I think that we need to look at black community leaders, uh, black activists in the community. I've held multiple town halls on racial justice and policing brutality. And, and, and I just need to, to back up a step because he keeps lying about me. And, and he just, I'm used to you not hearing me because when I came to DC, seeking your help, you wouldn't take a meeting with me. But let me be very clear. There is always going to need to be someone on the other end of the line when we're in distress. I don't support defunding the police. Okay. I'm not sure how many times I need to say that. And we're back again. Thank you uh, for that clip. And I'm curious to find out from our student responders uh, what their reaction was. Uh, one of the things that you didn't see was at the beginning of that clip that just bare, almost didn't make it in was uh, that Senator Cornyn referred to the African American Lives Matter movement. Uh, I think he didn't want to be on camera saying the words Black Lives Matter. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, what your reaction to the clip was. Uh, should candidates be working with uh, members of the Black Lives Matter movement? Should they be doing their own thing? Should they be uh, limiting their uh, efforts to working with people in government who are actually in a position to make real change? Uh, what should they be doing? And I think uh, this time we're back to you, Ferdinando, for the initial response. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, in this case, uh, I would have to say that it's not just about the Black Lives Movement. Like, if there is any issue that is affecting the society, politicians should try to address them. 
So I, I, I mean, yes, okay. In this case, we're gonna talk about Black Life Movement. I, I do believe that they should take this more into consideration because, um, it, it, it is not about just like banding all police. It's like there has to be a change in the way that, the, specifically, the Black community is being treated uh, with police. You know, so it, it is kind of sad that this person did not want to be seen as saying like black life movement <laughs> but he did say black and at some point in there and there, so it is kind of interesting um what can i tell you is this is uh, i believe that whenever you are in this position it is um it should be at least idealistically speaking uh your duty to try to fulfill uh, these issues and if you resist yourself you're not really doing completely your job uh, that's what I want to say, and I will leave it at that. Okay, uh, Reagan, how about you? What was your reaction to the two candidates? Thank you, Patrick. Well, first things first, the thing that stuck out to me the most was when he said the thin blue line between us and danger, and that to me was so strong because that thin blue line is the people that are putting us in danger because you can't, you know, when you hear the facts and you say, oh, there's not – you know, Republicans have been seen saying, oh, systematic racism doesn't exist. But when you have several black men saying that they feel threatened when a police officer comes up to their vehicle, that is a problem. Like he said, when he said, oh, I will, I associate myself with black leaders. Um, and then he went into that story about how that black pastor, the son doesn't trust police. That's our problem. Young African-American men are growing up to not trust police. So there shouldn't even be a parallel between Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. It should be, we want to enter racism. And the, you know, cops are saying, well, we want to better our systems. Just like there shouldn't be a parallel between white supremacy and our president, but there is. And that's where they're not addressing the parallels. And that's what's making me upset because when you address the problem in between, like Hager said, you know, you have to take accountability for your actions. You have to cite the problem so that we can fix the problem. But when you refuse to say that white supremacy should be condemned, and when you refuse to say that we should not only protect Black Lives Matter, but we should also hold police officers accountable, that's where the problems begin. You refuse to connect the dots. And that's why we have problems. And that's why our house is so divided. You know, a house that's divided cannot stand. And that has been said since the beginning. And unfortunately, our president is, you know, so strongly bent on making sure that we are divided as a country and as a unity when it comes to situations like that. And we're on the brink of a civil war because of it. Wow, on the brink of a civil war. That's, those are pretty strong words uh, coming from from Reagan there. I, I'll be interested to see if we get any responses uh, to that. Um, uh, it, it is interesting um, if, if anyone uh, has been in the market for uh, guns and ammunition lately, you will know that that uh, they are basically not available. There, there have been, been the, the entire firearms market in America has been turned on its ear by people who are probably uh, not so sure that Reagan doesn't have a point there. We'll we'll see how that all plays out, though. But uh, uh, okay. Anyway, let's move on uh, to Edward. Uh, your your reaction to this clip. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, well, I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna clarify what I'm saying. You know, we're all human beings. All of us. It doesn't matter what race or what color you are. We all matter in the eyes of God. I'm just gonna say it. But more, black black life does matter in this point because we've been suffering for how many years? I mean, I mean, Reagan, you can help me out. Like 364 years. About 400 years. It's been a long time. Exactly. You know, about 400 years we've been suffering from slavery to civil rights. I mean, it's like till now with like I mean like all this shooting that's happened from Eric Garner to Michael Brown to um, George Floyd to um, what's the young man named that got shot in Texas again? Um, Patrick, Moore. Jonathan Price. Yeah, him. So all this, I mean, yes, Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives Matter. So that's why I said Black Lives Matter more and more than any. I mean, than I mean than any other life. <laughs> I will lie. I love you guys, but Black Lives Matter than any other life right now because we we are the one being killed and we are the one suffering. You know, anytime I step out there, I get, even me, I get scared because I don't know what's going to happen to me as a black man. I was like, man, you know, it's just by the grace of God, I prayed. I said, God, 
help me out, you know, and God protect me. So, and also, you know, we should not defund the police. I mean, the police are here to help us, but take out the bad guys one, the bad people inside that is consuming, that is bringing cancer into the police, into the police department. Take them out, persecute them, punish them, even put them in death sentences. Shoot, I don't mind about death, death sentences at this time, bro. They got to go to death sentences. So just take them out of the police department. Just don't put them to jail and just release it, release them. So, oh, we don't find no evidence because why? Like, I mean, they're police officers. I mean, that's not right, you know? And I agree with, with Reagan. We can't associate, we can't associate ourselves from blue life to black life because we're all one. Or just like how our president can associate himself with um, white supremacy because he act like he's white supremacy, but technically he's not one. But he just wanna, I don't know what he's, I don't know what he's going through his mind sometimes. I don't know. He's just crazy. So I'm just gonna say. So I do agree with all. I mean, and I do agree with Fernando too. You know, if there's problem, there's an issue. Look at it. I mean, it doesn't matter what race, black life, Hispanic life, other I mean, Native American lives, because. All all of them have suffered through, I mean, you know, through the through about 400 years. We all have suffered. But now the reason we focus on black life, because that's what is going on in this current situation. So, yeah. OK, thank you, Edward. Uh, OK, um, we, let's move on to the, our next clip. We've uh, we've all seen in this year of 2020, 2020 has given us more than we had ever bargained for in many ways. Uh, another way that 2020 has given us a lot to think about is the fact that we've had multiple hurricanes. I have, my wife has family uh, in Louisiana that has been right in the path of a couple of these hurricanes. Uh, plus, we've had unprecedented wildfires in California. Uh, we've had the, the hottest September in the, in the, on record since uh, climate uh, weather records started being kept. Uh, and that uh, is in keeping with other heat records that we've had. Uh, it was just 90 degrees in Dallas yesterday. Not that that is uh, a symptom of anything, except that it's happening very, more and more and more often. And it's not just in the U.S., it's around the world. They've had uh, unprecedented wildfires in Australia. And uh, if you've been paying attention, I'm sure you have, uh, we've seen the same kinds of impacts around the world. So uh, we have the next clip talking about uh, climate change and the candidates' responses to that. Can we see the next clip, please? I do, and I believe climate change is the greatest existential threat to our species and to my children and grandchildren, children. but it's so much more than that. I stand with the Pentagon that it is a grave national security threat. I believe it is a huge economic threat, especially to Texas. We lead in the energy industry, and I would like to see us continue leading in the energy industry. For, re for me right now, this is about jobs. We've got to protect energy industry jobs. Those jobs are, we are bleeding energy industry jobs right now. Senator, do you believe humans are the primary driver behind climate change? 30 seconds. I can't quantify it, Robert, but I do agree that humans do affect the climate. But if MJ is worried about jobs, then she would not be advocating a carbon tax that will destroy the jobs of hundreds of thousands of workers out in West Texas and around the nation. Uh, it will raise prices for people on fixed income, seniors and others, and it will destroy what is really one of our crown jewels here in, in Texas, which is our energy ability to export energy around the world. Again, I have not advocated for a carbon tax. I said 11 countries have Thank them. You. We've, got um, to, we've got to get to another question. We're running out of time. Do you support a ban on fracking? Um, I do seconds. not support a ban on fracking. I do support investment in clean, renewable energy that gets us to a place where we don't need fracking. George Mitchell, the father of fracking, before he died, said that he thought we could do it cleaner and better without hurting our water and our land the way it's happening right now. So we need to stop the way it's happening right now and make sure it is happening in line with the father of fracking's vision for doing it in a way that doesn't hurt the water and the land while we transition to clean, renewable energy. Senator, what about a ban on fracking? 30 seconds. Well, everybody who's supporting MJ believes in a ban on fracking. I don't believe in a ban on fracking because it would destroy energy jobs in, in, in Texas and around, and around the country. Everybody? And I think make us dependent on imported energy from the Middle East, something we have been able to avoid. But 
everybody that uh, MJ is uh, receiving money from, whether it's the celebrities out in Hollywood or the elites on the East Coast, they believe in eliminating fossil fuels, including Joe Biden is on tape. Kamala Harris, the same. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've seen that clip now. Uh, and I'm curious to what our student responders will have to say about it. Uh, do you think that they, the candidates answered the questions about climate change? What about their answers? Uh, and uh, how would you uh, rate their responses on this important issue? Why don't we start with you this time, Reagan? Thank you, Patrick. Um, whether the Republicans want to admit it or not, fracking is one of the leading causes of our climate change happening. Um, it actually, when we frack, we release methane, which is one of the leading causes of climate change, as what is destroying our um, our reefs and is what's um, destroying our our icebergs and stuff like that. And it also leads to underwater earthquakes, which an under uh, underwater earthquake has recently destroyed like Hawaii's like islands and nearby reefs as well. So whether they want to admit it or not, she's saying, um, and Hamlet said, uh, Cam Senator Harris, I can't say her first name, um, mentioned this as well. They don't want to get rid of fracking. They want to alter it so that it has a better impact. Because as of right now, it's not only hurting, you know, our oceans, which, you know, hurts directly our food sources. A lot of our food sources come from the ocean as well. Um, they want to limit fracturing, uh, fracking and how it's hurting the environment. So I don't know why, but this has happened between Pence, Trump, and now um, Senator Cornyn. They, you know, just want to say that the Democrats are trying not to frack or trying to ban fracking. And I just, when you sit there and somebody says, no, we're not, we're trying to alter it. And you just keep saying, like, yeah, you're trying to ban it. It just makes you look incompetent. So he just kept trying to argue the fact that she couldn't understand what he was saying. But she was like, no, I answered your question. And I said how we're going to improve it. And that is something that throughout their entire party, they have not been able to do. Even when it came to the coronavirus, they had not been able to pinpoint the question and answer it. It's always been, oh, the Democrats are Democrats. And I'm tired. I just want answers at this point. And if they're giving me answers, I'm going to vote for them, period. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, what about you, Ferdinando? How would, how was your uh response to uh, the candidates on climate change. OK. Uh, yes, I agree with um, Reagan in this. Uh, fr fracking is so destructive. I remember Oklahoma uh, was averaging like maybe like two earthquakes like a year or so. And then those two was like a month or even even shorter. So it's like it's crazy the amount of damage that it does. Uh, it brings it, it damage your food. The water is gets contaminated. Everything gets contaminated. So I don't understand how can you even put into a, a debate or argument whether or not you should change it. Like it's, you should change it. Like you should look for different ways. Like there is no discussion here. Um, the fact that you're just like so oblivious it, it, for me just tells that. There's, there's probably a financial thing like behind the covers that you you're probably benefiting off of it one way or another because otherwise like I mean, for me it makes no sense honestly it makes no sense and it is also something that it, it's not about being democrat or republican it's about like what is the best interest for the country and uh, if you cannot see that this is going to last is, this is going to affect negatively the sustainability of the country uh, long term then I mean you kind of speak a lot about the the extremist side that we are having as a country. It shouldn't be just like red and, and, and blue. It should be like, okay, you have different opinions, but work more together. Like this is not something that it should be so polar, polarizing. It's affecting people equally, period. Okay, thank you, Ferdinando. And uh, Edward, you're very yes. happy on thank this you, one. Uh, Patrick Moore. Oh. Um, I agree with Fernando and, and Reagan on this. I mean, fracking, fracking, you know, is kind of related, like, is the cause of climate change. So this whole point that Republicans are always like, oh, Democrats going to ban this, Democrats going to do this, Democrats, I mean, it's annoying and it's, like, confusing to us at the same time. Like, they, they don't want to accept the fault that, okay, they, they believe in this, but they just want to blame other people. It's like, it's like, Let's say, for example, I I steal something, then I blame a Reagan. Oh, Reagan did this. I mean, to you, it, it might be annoying. Like, oh my God, like you literally said this. Now you blame it on me, so you get mad. So, you know, like like um, Fernando was saying that, like Oklahoma, and I was there. I was watching news. All this earthquake that was happening, 
and all this, even hurricane, this past hurricane that just happened. I mean, I mean, they're not realizing that climate change is the cause of all this, you know. They but they just be like, they just, you know, wish wish washing the whole idea, politicizing the whole idea, bringing politics on this, which it doesn't, I mean, it's not the case. Politics don't have to be in everything, you know. Think think about the people. Think about the the the, the nation. How many people are getting infected? I mean, if this your family that got infected, how will you feel? Don't just stop polit um, politicizing this. So I feel like they need to do something climate change. Like I think it was Joe Biden or Kamala Harris was saying that we should go back to a Paris Paris Accord. In which, I mean, I don't know if MJ Hager did um, talk about it in the um, Senate debate. Maybe. She did. We didn't, you know, watch the whole full clip, but we need to go back to the Paris Accord because that was helping us, helping us a lot, you know, by reducing all this, by reducing the climate change. So since Trump came in, came into office, he just took out of us in the Paris Accord, and all this started happening. Then when they asked him, oh no, it's just it's just people. I mean, really? So yeah, I feel like that's my answer. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, the The last clip today has to do with uh, a topic that is uh, frequently a favorite of my classes to talk about uh, for whatever reason. I, I draw no judgments on that, uh, but decriminalization of marijuana. Uh, there is currently legislation uh, pending in the United States legislature, in the federal legislature, that would decriminalize uh, marijuana and and put a, a legislative, a statutory stop to the federal government interfering with state laws. It would uh, allow the states to, without fear of the federal government coming in and overriding their laws, uh, uh, to regulate marijuana as they choose. Uh, this is always, it's always popular to talk about in my classes. Uh, because it's part of the uh, a great example of how federalism works in America. Anyway, uh, so this clip is about decriminalization of marijuana, and I'll be interested in your reactions to it. Let's have the clip. I think before we answer that question, we need to have some very uh, comprehensive research done on the effect of marijuana, THC, the active ingredient, on the developing brains of children. Um, we know that vaping among kids and using things like THC concentrates uh, can have a dramatic impact on their mental health and on their physical health as well. So I think before we make those decisions, we need to, we need to know what the facts are. But as the research stands right now, and if you were the deciding vote, would you decriminalize marijuana? I would not do it without the uh, research that I just described. Okay, Ms. Hagar, would you support decriminalizing marijuana? Yes. Um, for multiple reasons. I have a lot of experience with the effects, the medicinal effects. Um, a lot of uh, military veterans that have PTSD that can ease those symptoms through that. Um, I don't support giving it to children. Um, I think we should regulate it like tobacco and, and uh, we should benefit from the taxes on it as well. Um, but I do think we should decriminalize it because it has also led to a disproportionate impact to communities of color of the incarceration epidemic in this country. Um, the private the private prisons and detention centers that are donating to his campaign want it to stay that way, though. Okay. Okay. Uh, there it was. There was the clip. Decriminalization of marijuana. Um, what is your reaction to decriminalization? Uh, and what is your reaction to uh, the, the idea that we need more studies uh, and, uh, and the idea that we should uh, use it as a source of tax revenue? I'm particularly interested in that. So research, tax, uh, what is your take on it? Ferdinando, let's start with you this time. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, interesting topic. Um, I think research is already there, honestly speaking, and I, I do believe that it should be discriminalized uh, mostly because of what, uh, Hager is the name, the last name? I'm bad with names, I'm so sorry. Uh, it does affect hugely, like minorities' uh, population more than other ones. And on, when, honestly speaking, if you just be here in the United States for like three months, you will see that so many people are using it. So well, you might as well just like make it like um, 
formalized, you know. And and I do remember I, I I don't remember the name of the president. That's so sad. Remember that the marijuana in the first place was considered illegal, not because of the effect that it actually has, but it was because of a way that they could use to uh, like kind of like guilt certain groups of people that they wanted to like arrest. So if the even beginning of this institutional sensation as a, a illegal was something as a like tricky move to get people into jail, like then we should revise then whether or not it is really um, a good, it was a good decision. Um, it does have very good uh, effects on people. I, I have had people who with medic, like with doctor's approval that have to take just so they can sleep and um, it does have some benefits. I, I do agree that they shouldn't be given to like minors or anything, but I believe that with proper regulation and the tax that comes with it, it could help a lot the country financially, uh, uh, healthy-wise, and so on. So yes, I mean, I wouldn't concern myself with it. Okay, thank you, Ferdinando. No, no need for uh, confessions here. Um, the, uh, one of the one of the things that's interesting that they didn't get into in the clip that you referred to is the the history of, uh, of criminalization of marijuana and there are uh, historical uh, records and people historians we need to get a historian on to talk about that but uh, uh, that there are a lot of people who allege that uh, marijuana was criminalized in the way it was made a Schedule One substance. Uh, based on uh, racist uh, views of who was using it and how it was used and how uh, the effects that it had and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm making no statements about that, but I'm saying that that is an interesting part of the debate that they didn't get into, that you referred to. So uh, next, uh, Edward, uh, what is your take on the decriminalization question? Thank you, Patrick. Um, I do agree with Fernando on this one. Uh, we need to de decriminalize marijuana because, um, like Hegel was saying, because you know, one, it can help mental health, mental health people and people with health problems. So you know, when the doctors has like prescribed, you know, you know how did this doctor pres prescribe medicine, and you know, if it's the right one, you know, you can just take it and maybe you get healed. So I feel like that can also help with people with you know health like um you know different type of health issues that's going on and um, but also i don't support i don't support them giving it to kids you know or you know we young ones because like Hager said we like to abuse it a lot so which is true so you know <laughs> but give it to people that need it you know that you know like people that we like i said with health issues so and this issue about criminalizing because of you know because like you said the past few years you know people has been like you know based on races, you know, like all African Americans, maybe Hispanic, you know, take it to for drugs and they put them in jail, which, you know, is which is not right, you know. Um, so yeah, I feel like we should de decrim decrim uh, decriminalize marijuana. That's my point. Okay. Um uh and and I I just wanna clarify all of y'all were and you could don't need to make extended answers to this. Uh, based on a couple of the comments, I'm not quite sure. Uh, were you just talking about decriminalization for purposes of medical use only, or would you uh, decriminalize for for recreational purposes as well, or for general use, general non-medical use? Uh, and so, uh, once again, I, we we are really out of time here, and so we don't have time to extended answers, but. Uh, I was curious what y'all might think about that. Edward, starting with you. Do you understand the question? Oh, no, not really. Can you repeat that? Okay. the The, the question is uh, based on something you said. I wasn't sure whether you were talking about uh, legalizing use only for medical purposes or for general use. What What uh, in the country today we call recreational use. Uh, would you allow marijuana to be used among adults, obviously, uh, for recreational purposes or, or solely for medical purposes? Um, oh, maybe. OK, maybe I didn't make myself clear. It was both. Sorry, it was both. Sorry. Sorry, it was both. All right. All right. <laughs> no, that's a, that's okay. I just, based on what you said, I wasn't sure what you were what you were saying. Uh, 
And what what about right. y'all? Uh, uh, Fernando, same thing. Uh, I would say uh, mostly just for uh, healthy issues. But if I think it should be if if recreational, it should be like limited. Like it should be maybe treated more as an alcohol. Like you can like use it way too much. There should be some type of regulation because some people just put too much into it. Okay. Um, okay. And you, Megan, same thing? I would say both because um, not only could it be used for medical uses, it has been reported that athletes use it as well to help with their injuries from, um, it can be used as a morphine for elderly people, you know, if they're suffering from cancer, it can kind of calm them and allow them to sleep like Ferdinando said. But I would also say that you can use it for recreational use because tobacco is one of the leading deaths and is one of the most overused drugs. And if you look at the causes of death between marijuana and the cause of death between tobacco, the death rate is not nearly as high as tobacco is, and yet it is sold on every street corner, every gas station that you can find between here to like wherever you want to go. You can find at least three or five, you know, gas stations that will supply you with that. So I feel like why shouldn't marijuana be the same? So I feel like if you do want to use it, you can abuse it as you can with tobacco, but it should, you know, you should be able to have that same option. And as far as the um, decriminalization, when it comes to marijuana, you know, rappers and artists and mo even movies, black people were portrayed as kind of the users of marijuana. We called them Mary Jane. People made songs about it. Um, people painted pictures and we were kind of portrayed as, you know, kind of the druggies who use marijuana or hippies or whatever you want to call it. And I feel like for a long time, people have kind of prosecuted us for that. And I feel like it's time that we, you know, kind of get out of that systematic racism again. All right, all right, thank you. Uh, and that uh, finishes it for today. Those are the, the only clips we've got. Um, I appreciate very much y'all's willingness to be here. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope y'all have a good day. Stay healthy. Thank you, Professor Moore, and thank you, panelists. That concludes our conversation for today. For Chronicle TV, I'm Damon Craig. Thank you for joining us.